Um, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. My name's Bridget Anderson and I'm the Director of Migration Mobilities Bristol, which is a specialist research institute at the University of Bristol. I'm really delighted to be chairing this conversation and the launch of this fantastic book, A World Without Cages, published by Routledge. Um, I was actually lucky enough to attend the workshop on immigration and prison justice that was organized by Shari and Stephanie uh, on decarceral futures back in 2019. So I've had a bit of an opportunity to watch the collection grow. Uh, it was a really memorable workshop and I think memorable for one of the reasons that it's a really great edited volume because it's where theory meets practice to build politics and I think you know in these kinds of fields like immigration and prison abolitionism it's really important to move beyond critique to build justice and to kind of have ideas about what might a better world look like. So um, we've assembled some outstanding panelists who are really innovative thinkers and actors and I'd really like to thank them all for coming to share their ideas with us. So as warm a welcome as is possible on Zoom to the, to the panelists and to all of you participants. Um, we hope that the format is going to maximize conversations around the issues. We appreciate that um, some of you here wouldn't have a, had a chance to read the book. So we're going to start with an overview of the book, followed by comments from a prison justice perspective by Al Jones for about 15 minutes. And then Cesar Hernandez will offer comments from an immigration or crimigration perspective. And then the two editors of the book, Shari Aiken and Stephanie Silverman, will kick off a conversation between themselves and the panelists by responding to some of the input. And then we'll have about half an hour to hear from you with questions and comments and so on. So do feel free to put those questions and comments in the chat as we're going along and I'll do my best to keep an eye on it. So uh, I'm gonna just um, jump right in because I wanna maximize the time we have and start by introducing Kate, Kate Motluck, who's going to give us the overview of the book and its key contributions. Kate is a PhD student at the Balsillie School of International Affairs at the University of Waterloo in Ontario. Her research is focused on issues of forced migration with a particular interest in the intersection of migration and criminalization. She completed her undergraduate degree in peace, conflict and justice studies at the University of Toronto and then went on to work as the Toronto chapter lead for the Refugee Hub's pro bono legal programme and as a project coordinator for the Toronto based nonprofit Lifeline Syria. While serving with these organisations, Kate has assisted with the file management and submission of over 400 private sponsorship refugee applications to the Canadian government. She went on to do a MA in Geography at Wilfrid Laurier University and her thesis, Containment and COVID-19 in the Settler State, examined the responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in carceral spaces across Canada and Australia. Uh, uh, welcome to you, Kate, and I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you so much, Bridget, for that introduction. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us today for this conversation on a world without cages. I'm gonna quickly start my timer so that I keep to the time that I have. But as Bridget mentioned, I have the distinct pleasure of providing a bit of an overview of this text for those of you who have not yet had the opportunity to read it. Although, of course, I emphatically encourage you to read it when you have the opportunity to do so. And I'm going to make some preliminary comments on the methodologies that are used and some of the novel contributions that this text offers to us. And as Bridget mentioned, it's really fascinating that this edited collection is the end result of these conversations and presentations that took place back in May of 2019 at Decarceral Futures. And I think the fact that this edited collection is the result of this kind of collaboration really speaks to some of its key strengths, namely just how highly interdisciplinary and collaborative the end result is, and also that it truly seeks to abide by the maxim of nothing about us without us. 
process. So not only is there great diversity in terms of the author's own personal backgrounds and their disciplinary approaches, but also the lived experiences with incarceration. And I really found when reading the text that they tried to forefront the voices of people with lived experiences at every opportunity. So a world without cages really seeks to understand what carceral abolition can bring to citizenship studies. So there's this effort then to marry attempts to abolish prison, so penal abolition, and to abolish forms of migration control like immigration detention. And this is of course unfolding in different ways across different jurisdictions. So I'm based in Canada and a number of the contributors to the collection were also based in Canada. And there, there are instances where some migrants who are held under migration controls are actually kept in prisons along with people who are being held under criminal charges. And as a result of that physical overlapping, there's a very clear alignment of these agendas, right, of abolishing these kinds of control. But what A World Without Cages does really deftly, I think, is demonstrate how even in spaces where there may not be this physical overlapping, there's clear overlapping of the logics that are driving this kind of confinement. Now, I do want to emphasize something that A World Without Cages does at many opportunities, which is that they never seek to privilege some identities as being worthy of better treatment than others. So unfortunately, you can sometimes see this in some work on immigration where people will say, isn't it so terrible that migrants are being treated this way when they may not have even committed a crime, notwithstanding the larger conversation we'll have about immigration a little bit later. But instead, A World Without Cages is recognizing that criminals, migrants, all of these different people being placed into categories are ultimately people. And this form of deprivation of liberty is ultimately extremely harmful to everybody. While I was reading this text, I was struck by a quote that I had saved from Ruth Wilson Gilmore. And those of you in the audience who've engaged with abolition literature for a long time will of course be very familiar with her, but as someone who still considers themselves sort of newer to the struggle, just to bring everyone into the conversation in case you're not familiar. She's a very well-regarded scholar and activist who has written extensively on the topic of abolition. And the quote that I'm using comes from her text on prisons, the prison system in California called the Golden Goulet. And she writes, it is not only a good theory in theory, but also a good theory in practice for people engaged in the spectrum of social justice struggles to figure out unexpected sites where their agendas align with those of others. And I think A World Without Cages really does this phenomenally well. Uh, Bridget already mentioned this idea of practice, right? Research as praxis. And that's clear throughout A World Without Cages. This emphasis on, although this book is ultimately a scholarly academic effort, there's also all of this attention being paid to how do we translate this knowledge into meaningful practice. Not only is there clearly an identification of how these agendas align between carceral abolition and citizenship studies, but I also found that at every turn, a world without cages really uh, resists this idea of treating injustices in isolation and takes a very intersectional approach. As a result, as you're reading through the different contributions, you'll notice a number of different analytical lenses. There's a contribution that takes a reproductive justice lens, another that takes a political economy lens, and another still that takes a settler colonialism lens. And so by using all of these different analytical tools, we're able to nuance and tease apart these ideas of how carceral abolition and citizenship studies fit together to an even greater degree, and also complicate certain ideas that perhaps we might take for granted in other contexts. For example, I was really struck by a conversation about birthright citizenship that occurred within the text. So often there's sort of a knee jerk reaction for those of us amongst in, you know, migration advocacy that birthright citizenship is a positive thing. So for those unfamiliar, this would be the idea that, you know, if there was a migrant in Canada who gave birth to a child, that child would get Canadian citizenship. And the positive to that is, of course, that they're not being born into a precarious status. But what the text cautions us is that we might be inadvertently then supporting the very category of citizenship, which is in part responsible for creating these categories of precarity that we're trying to fight against. So this tension that emerges, and it's interesting too how they talk about this tension that comes about when you align yourself with those who are perhaps advocating against birthright citizenship, but you might find yourself aligned with people who have very different political goals, often anti-migrant in nature. <laughs> 
So by having this intersectional approach, by thinking about reproductive justice, political economy, and all of these other analytical lenses, we really tease apart some of these ideas that require complication in order to have a meaningful version of abolition at the end. It also continuously re-emphasizes the need to look upstream, to borrow a word from the text. So a need to understand, of course, what's happening in these carceral spaces, that is sort of the main focus and concern of the text, but what are these systems and histories that are bringing people to these carceral spaces to begin with? And understanding the ways that racism, sexism, ableism, heteronormativity are all woven into these logics and fabrics that are bringing people here. In addition to taking this approach that's very interdisciplinary in terms of the focus of what kinds of injustice are being rendered, pardon me, I'll just take a quick sip of water. The world without cages is also quite multi-scalar in its analysis. And so not only does a world without cages offer us um, case studies from North America, from Europe, from Asia, but it's also happening at different levels. And maybe this is a little bit hinted at with the title, right? A world without cages, which signals something kind of collective and more globalized. But what we find is that we have case studies at the national level, which is a familiar level when you're thinking about migration control. So there's some focus on Canada, on Turkey, on Indonesia, but there's also more broadly looking at regions like the European Union. And then also taking it to a smaller scale and looking at an individual state within the United States, in this case, Tennessee. And through looking at this diversity of region and scale, new sort of findings can come out as a result of that too. So not just that um, national policies have international implications, but really teasing apart what that can mean in certain contexts. So in a world without cages, there's a case study on Turkey and a recognition that immigration detention is being implemented not only to serve sort of domestic goals of controlling migrants, but also to serve the goal of uh, acting as border a spectacle to again use terminology from the text and this idea that Turkey is trying to signal to the EU a willingness to act as a migrant controlling sort of policing state and preventing people from reaching Europe. And this of course contributes to these ongoing conversations that we've heard a lot about, about Turkey seeking membership into the EU. And then at the smaller scale, if we start to look at an individual state within the United States, we find that we can go again even smaller to different municipalities, but also even to individuals. So this contribution looks at the role of individual sheriffs signing onto these contracts that are quite controversial. Some of you may be familiar with them, the 287G contracts, which allowed local police departments to take on the role of enforcing federal immigration law. So essentially acting in part like ICE agents. And as a result, you suddenly see these spaces that are far removed from the physical border of the US acting as a space of border enforcement and border surveillance, and thus ultimately also border violence. But a world without cages for me is truly about the future, even though it's spending a lot of careful time looking at the histories of these forms of oppression and trying to bear witness to contemporary iterations. It's nonetheless doing so, so that we can really imagine what a world without cages could look and feel like. And one thing that is um, certainly emphasized in the text is that reforms are not enough. We cannot reform away these underpinning logics of punishment, of domination, of dehumanizing and the text does look at alternatives, so it goes over some of these instances where alternatives to detention have been implemented, and it does find that in some of those instances, they are more humane, and I'm not trying to discount the value in reducing harm, but nonetheless, they offer us a reality that's a continuing of unfreedom, to again borrow um, words from within the book. And so in order to reach true liberation, we need to look to abolition. And what I take as the core message from a world without cages is that abolition is not a single solution, right? So it's not just about removing prisons and removing immigration detention centers. It's about crafting an entirely new world that's founded in caremongering, in mutual aid, in individual resistance um, and collective solidarity. And in some ways that can feel very overwhelming and the text acknowledges that, which I really appreciate, you know, especially when you're railing against these systems of settler colonialism, of racism, of histories of slavery. And yet, as is repeated often in the text as well, it's urgent. And it feels 
particularly necessary and urgent when you contextualize not only reducing this harm, which obviously needs to happen, but when you background that with a world that's grappling with, you know, the climate crisis, with wars, with pandemics. So in this way, for me, abolition is not just about the undoing of some things, but it's really about the undoing and redoing, perhaps, of all things. And there's something extremely hopeful about that as well. I wondered too, when I was thinking through this idea of abolition as being all of these many things and not centered on just this one change, if, uh, and maybe Sherry and Stephanie will comment on this later, but it struck me that the original workshop was called Decarceral Futures, plural. And maybe it was getting to that idea too of the need to create all of these different futures in order to meaningfully achieve um, abolition. And I wanted to end my contribution today, and hopefully that was a good way of introducing everyone to the text with some words from the text itself. So this comes from the introduction, which was authored by Sherry and Stephanie, and they're sort of summarizing some of the ideas that they found um, emerged when looking at all of these contributions together. And note that the contributors are thinking across the spectrum of defunding policing, overhauling the criminal justice system, eradicating prisons, penal abolitionism, and doing away with all forms of containment, carceral abolitionism. The collective findings reaffirm that neither the prison nor the detention center is inevitable in the modern democratic order. Abolishing all forms of immigration detention would open the door for the emergence of new visions of justice. And I think it's through opening that door that we really start to see what a world without cages could look like. So thank you so much for your time and I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. I was waiting for Sorry. an intro. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm very still after all these years, I'm still not managing these wretched buttons. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kate. That was absolutely um, that was absolutely fantastic. And I do think that there is something about um, you know these making about the ways in which when we think about futures and make futures that we are actually also making spaces in the present and we should, you know, and like the space that we're all in now, which unfortunately is virtual. But um, yeah, so I really appreciated that. Um, and um, now I'd like to uh, introduce Elle Jones, a poet, journalist, professor and activist living in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She was Halifax's Poet Laureate from 2013 to 15, and she teaches at Mount St. Vincent University, where she was named the 15th Nancy's Chair in Women's Studies in 2017. Her work focuses on social justice issues, including feminism, prison abolition, anti-racism and decolonization. And she's authored some fiercely fantastic prose and poetry, but perhaps most relevant for this audience is abolitionist intimacies in which she considers the movement to abolish prisons through the black feminist principles of care and collectivity. Understanding the history of prisons in Canada and their relationship to settler colonialism and anti-Black racism, she observes how practices of intimacy are imbued with state violence at carceral sites, but she also shows how intimacy is integral to the ongoing struggles for justice and liberation through the care work of building relationships and organising with people inside. And she argues beautifully that abolition is not only a political movement to end prisons, it's also an intimate one, deeply motivated by commitment and love. Really looking forward to your comments, Elle. Thank you so much. And as I said, I apologize. I have to do this from my phone. So calls may come in. There's no way to block them. So if I get knocked off because the call came in, I'll just come back. So please be patient. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm speaking to you from Jabuktuk, Halifax, Nova Scotia, the unceded and unsurrendered territories of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, this book is coming at a really, I think, important and fraught time in uh, our activism in Canada. In the past couple of months, uh, BC has been successful in canceling the arrangement with CBSA with the province. So for those who aren't familiar, as was mentioned in the introduction, in Canada, immigration detention largely takes place in provincial uh, facilities. And so 
those facilities contract with CBSA to allow immigration detention to take place. So in BC, there was a successful campaign from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International that demanded that the province end those agreements, thus ending the practice of provincial immigration detention. And that campaign has now moved to my province in Nova Scotia and also in Quebec. Now, of course, there are challenges with that because we know that the state, when we uh, close one avenue of incarceration. It's not like then they just let us all free. We know that we're going to move to other forms of detention. As is mentioned in this book, there's discussions, for example, of electronic surveillance and the ways that those kind of mechanisms of carcerality are coming in. Um, I myself am currently paying for a bracelet for somebody because the option was jail or bracelet. Um, the cost is incredibly expensive beyond obviously the ability of most families. Um, I've said ironically that the number of crimes that are committed so that people can pay for these bracelets, you know, but I'm being ironic, but of course it's quite true, right? That people who are already on subsistence living now have to pay uh, 600 plus dollars a month for electronic monitoring, which comes out of your own pocket. Um, so to say that we are, guardedly optimistic. I think uh, getting the provinces to end this agreement is an important one, but also a challenging one, as we know that, as Catherine McKittrick tells us, um, Black death and the prison will always renew itself again and again and again. And Lisa Lowe as well reminds us of this, that the settler colonial state will always reincarnate itself in new forms under the name of reform. Secondly, people may be familiar with uh, the letter written by Jamaican farm workers in the last couple of weeks. Um, this has been quite some news. So uh, the farm ministers, the minister responsible for farming in Jamaica was going to come and tour farms in Canada. And in response, an incredibly courageous move, the workers on those farms and a couple of farms in Ontario wrote an open letter. And this is, of course, courageous because the kind of retaliation that happens to workers when they do this is extreme. And they described their um, conditions variously as systematic slavery. We are treated like mules. Uh, they compared their conditions to prison, which is very relevant here, and said they're experiencing exploitation at a seismic level. And people can find that letter online if you're interested. Um, so this was in many ways an unprecedented move where a collective of farm workers addressed the Jamaican ministers to reveal the conditions that they're experiencing. And this was, of course, after the death of a farm worker named Garvin Yap, who died while on the job. For those who aren't familiar with uh, the Canadian Farm Worker Program, those who enter the program do not have a path to citizenship. They have no right to healthcare, education, or any status in the country. They come at the whim of their employer and they can be removed at any time. And there are multiple removals that take place. So they come here eight months a year on minimum wage under the idea that these wages are adequate in Jamaica and they have no kind of status or path to status at all in the country. So that was actually a very important moment where those workers banded together to give us a picture of what is happening. As may be expected, the minister said they were going, he was going to tour the farms and then said publicly that he saw no problems on the farms and everything was fine, so boo to him. Um, finally, an academic letter has been circulating demanding status for all that many educators have signed on. So to say that we're in a period in Canada where migrant worker activism and uh, anti-carceral uh, immigration activism is incredibly powerful. I come to this work through my work in prison justice. I sometimes say I became an abolitionist at age 13 when I read Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde and was immediately struck by the injustice of prison. Um, in my adult life, I began working with those inside prison in relationship with them. The title of my book, Intimacies, is, um, I don't really like this phrase, working with, like as if it's a chore. We are, I'm in relationship with, friendship with, love with uh, many people who are incarcerated. And we work together to organize for liberation. And in the course of that work, um, because of the ties between the immigration system and the criminal justice system, um, really, we were just thrown into also doing anti-deportation activism. So the last chapter of this book deals with the case of a young man named Abdul Abdi, a Somali uh, refugee who came to Canada with his sister Fatuma. Um, they were taken into the government care, into the child foster program as children, and they did not receive citizenship. Um, their aunt who had come with them and who, is with them, who identifies as their mother actually at various points applied for citizenship herself and they took the children off the application and said, well, you don't have guardianship. When Abdul turned 19 after being bounced between 31 different homes, including uh, youth care, so youth jail, which again shows how many children that are in the refugee system end up criminalized as youth, um, including group homes, 
and of course many temporary housing situations. Both children, both Fatuma and Abdul were brutally abused in all of these situations, abuse of every possible kind. And when Abdul turned 19 years old and committed a crime, he was scheduled for deportation. Um, minors in Canada until 2017 could not apply for citizenship on their own behalf. So there was simply no way that he could have got citizenship. And as well in our system, youth crimes are treated under the immigration system as adult crimes. So while we have a Youth Justice Act that recognizes that children are differentially responsible, when it comes to immigration consequences, the very same holds are put on youth. So if you commit a crime, uh, a so-called crime, I don't buy into this idea of crime, but you know, if you're criminalized, um, then you have a five-year hold before you can even apply. Abdul was criminalized by the age of 10, and one of the first encounters he had with the police in the child welfare system was his sister was removed from one of the homes due to sexual abuse. Abdul was left there, and he took the family car to go looking for his sister, his only family member, and the police were called. And this is, of course, very common for children in child welfare. I could speak about the Abdul case for a long time. I encourage you to read the chapter. Um, we became involved when Abdul's cellmate, who is actually the nephew of a very famous case in Canada, a woman named Ashley Smith, who died uh, in prison. She'd been taken into prison as a youth for throwing apples at her probation officer, um, was moved from solitary confinement to solitary confinement, remained in uh, confinement as an adult, and began to essentially stimulate herself by wrapping things around her throat in order to get attention or to feel some kind of human connection. And she died in GVI, a woman's prison, after she strangled herself with her sheets and the guards stood outside her cell for 45 minutes and watched her die. And that is a very, very famous case in Canada. Her nephew became incarcerated. Um, in fact, many of her family members are incarcerated. And her brother, Corey, who was in prison at the time when he found out about her death, very famously, um, you know, just freaked out on staff and they reinforced his cell with like steel. And that cell is a notorious cell. Everyone calls it Corey's cell. And if you misbehave, you're placed into the cell. Her nephew uh, was incarcerated with Abdul and it was his call that began the activism for Abdul. He said, this young man is here and there's something, we need to do something. And that started myself, Desmond Cole, Idil Abdullahi, a number of people, it was a national movement, lawyer Ben Perryman, upon... Uh, we were very much jumped into this immigration work. So to that point, we had been doing prison work, or organizing with prisoners to organize strikes, uh, wrongful conviction work, court work, working with women, uh, working with trans non-binary people. We were doing a kind of full service, uh, trying to just take calls and meet needs. And then we had this immigration call. We all had to learn immigration law overnight, essentially. Um, and Ben Perryman was... Um, extremely helpful in that process. Uh, that case, we were actually successful and we were able to successfully um, halt Abdul's deportation. I do want to say as well that this activism was led by Fatuma, Abdul's sister, who was six months pregnant at the time, which brings in this issue of reproductive justice that also occurs in the book. Um, she was actually supposed to be on bed rest, but uh, you know, she said, I'll do anything I can for my brother and quite famously stood up in front of our prime minister and said, why are you deporting my brother? Would you deport your own son? and then waited for his answer. And this began a movement in Canada where former child uh, refugees, former children in care without status are now suing multiple governments and Abdul and Fatuma suing our provincial government in Nova Scotia for their neglect. It also caused a policy change where in Nova Scotia, they now have to ensure that youth in care have citizenship. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I can't tell you all of Fatuma's story, but many people know Abdul's story. Fatuma's story is extremely important also for its gendered aspects. Um, she had many children removed from her by child welfare, and one of her children actually died in care and has not even been given a headstone. So she does not know where that child died. Um, so that illustrates, I think, so many things about this system. So the case of Abdul, I think one reason why it became headline using Canada is it really exemplified all of the issues that this book takes on. We have reproductive justice. We have the treatment of Black youth. Um, Abdul did not receive an education. We have the intersections between both the adult criminal system and the youth criminal system, the child welfare system, um, and of course the refugee system. So all of these things came together in that case and black people in Canada responded on a huge level because people recognized uh, what was happening here. That was quite unusual because often of course there's a stigma where people feel like these people are embarrassing us very much as the idea of the good immigrant, you know, the settle settlement, the person who deserves this. You know, we have uh, very much a narrative where um, those who are immigrants feel like they should be grateful, um, you know, that they owe something to this country, and these kind of people are an embarrassment and make it harder for the good immigrants. So one thing that was quite 
uh, effective in that case was it was in fact a lot of good organizations for the good settlers that agreed with us that what was happening to Abdul was egregious. Um, so I just want to cite that. I also just to tell some more cases where these intersections take place. I've been recently working, I won't say his name, um, but a young man who was incarcerated, he had been incarcerated federally. And then as happens, if you, your sentence expires and you're scheduled for deportation, you end up reincarcerated in a provincial facility. I need to speed up. I'll tell these two really quickly and then we'll end. Uh, you end up reincarcerated in a provincial facility. That's called gating by guys in prison. Um, and that reincarceration, if you wait for deportation, is indefinite and unlimited. So it's until they can deport. Um, he ended up with stage four cancer. They did not take him to be treated as he was passing out, uh, passing blood, losing half his body weight until the men in prison literally refused to lock up, risking disciplinary consequences themselves and said, you have to take this man to prison. That began, I mean, to, to hospital. That began a year long ordeal of us trying to get him out while battling the two intersecting systems where he had in the meantime, while returned to jail, he'd been peripherally involved in a jail fight where they heavily criminalized everybody in this fight um, held people on these massive charges, like attempted murder, conspiracy to commit. Everyone ended up charged with like obstructing officers. That was all they got sentenced with. But in this course of overcharging everybody, he ended up caught up in that and then ended up with criminal charges again on top of his deportation. We had to make our way through this double system to get this man out so he could die at home. Um, and that has been a long process. He is currently, of course, uh, on an ankle bracelet that we had to pay for. I have to pay security fees for police to take him to the hospital every month. And they charge me for two days of salary every time. So I have to pay thousands of dollars a month so this man can go to a medical appointment. He does not have health status. So we, um, it is only because his doctor is agreeing to treat him for free through a migrant health center that he's able to get treatment. And one thing that's interesting about that is that one of the arguments they made to detain him was, well, since he's in prison, he has health care. And if he doesn't, if we get him out of prison, we won't give him health care. So he's safer in prison. So this is actually one of the arguments made during COVID for a man with stage four cancer. Another case I also did was a young woman who was age 16, who was incarcerated um, and they did not have her documents. So even though she was a youth, she ended up in an adult incarceration. We had to fight to get her out. So these stories, I just wanted to tell some of these stories and how I ended up in this work to show what these um, the men, and she was also in child welfare. So as we think about these carceral systems, we see how through the lens of immigration, through this lens of citizenship and who belongs and who's in and out and who's a threat, um, something that is, of course, as in many countries in Canada, very much a growing idea, um, you know, citizenship, freedom. We have these freedom convoys like waving Canadian flags that, um, you know, claim to be for freedom, but are explicitly xenophobic, anti-immigrant, Islamophobic. Um, we know that this discourse ties to other forms of discipline and control that we've been fighting through the abolition movement. So the control of borders, the control of children, uh, control through the healthcare system, psychiatric institutions, policing, of course, as we fight for defunding. Um, so we see all these connections. So just for 30 seconds to end, um, I really do encourage you to read the book. Um, it takes an international lens. Uh, we have so, so making very clear that what happens in one country, it moves around in this neoliberal world. So these uh, strategies of securitization are not local. They are in fact international and they are fed from one country to another, which I think is an extremely important perspective. We have a lot of readings of the connections of slavery, coolism, indentured labor, um, the ways that the post-slavery world constructs migration, uh, the status of workers, the status of sex workers, trans non-binary people, uh, what uh, those who identify as women experience. So I think as I see in my own work, we cannot understand this system without working in all other systems. I fell into it through working in prison and then found myself um, you know, constantly challenging these deportations from that perspective. I've run out of time, so I will stop now. Sorry to talk a little long and I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Not at all, Al. That was just really fantastic, really powerful. And I think kind of learning about those, um, how you came into it and the sort of particularities of people's situations and struggles is actually really important. And one of the things I was struck by actually that kind of connects yours and Kate's comments is, is the, the ways in which kind of prison and criminalization kind of bolsters these ideologies of deservingness and sort of reinforces this false assumption of a relationship between deservingness and 
unjust and justice, which I think is really, really important to kind of challenge. So thank you for that. Um, and now we're going to hear from Cesar Hernandez. He's the Gregory Williams Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at Ohio State University, where he writes and teaches about the intersection of criminal and immigration law. He's published two books, Migrating to Prison and Crimigration, Crimigration Law. Um, and his analyses of policies affecting migrants has appeared uh, in media in the United States and abroad. Um, his, uh, he's passed Fulbright Scholar and has been a scholar in residence at the University of California, Berkeley and Texas Southern University. And in 2019, the Civil Rights Education and Enforcement Center honored him with its Challenging Discrimination Award. He's also a past recipient of the Derek A. Bell Junior Award by the Association of American Law School Section on Minority Groups which is an honor issued to, quote, a junior faculty member who through activism, mentoring, colleagueship, teaching and scholarship has made an extraordinary contribution to legal education, the legal system or social justice. So very appropriate speaker. Um, over to you, Cesar. Thank you so much, Bridget. It's my great pleasure to participate in this conversation. I'm especially grateful to, to Sherry and to Stephanie for editing this volume. Um, it was an honor to, to be able to attend the convening that hatched the, um, the book uh, and an honor to be a part of today's gathering. So I'm actually based, um, so I'm actually uh, currently located in Mexico City um, where I'm, I'm living for, for a year or so. Um, and just yesterday successfully finalized my, my own immigration uh, process. So uh, through an extremely uh, privileged and fortunate uh, um, uh, way of doing so, but uh, nonetheless, a special relevance to today's conversation for, for me personally. Um, but I am, uh, as, as um, Sherry, uh, sorry, as Bridget um, uh, mentioned, a legal scholar uh, based in the United States. Um, and as such, I think the notion of a world without cages, to borrow the title of, of the book, is, is nothing if not fanciful. Um, whether it's in the criminal, criminal legal system or in the civil administrative immigration law enforcement context, uh, imprisonment, of course, in the United States is commonplace. Uh, arrest is routine. Conditions of confinement are harsh. The prison estate is expansive. In practice, um, just like in law, it's easy for government officials to deprive people of their liberty. Um, and while most people are eventually released, they're released on terms set by others, by police, by prosecuting attorneys, by judges. Um, and various phrases have been used to describe what's more or less the same phenomenon of extraordinary incarceration. There's probably the, the most well-known of the phrases, mass incarceration, there's hyper-incarceration, there's the new Jim Crow. And in this decade long political context in the United States, it's easy to find uh, much to criticize, but directly and indirectly, several of the contributors to this volume go well beyond that. Most explicitly, Michelle Brown writes about the pernicious effects of um, these 287G agreements that Kathleen uh, mentioned earlier, um, 287G agreements through which the federal government's immigration law enforcement entities are augmented by state and local police forces. And given the decentralized nature of policing power in the United States, uh, Brown's treatment of cooperative arrangements like these 287G agreements is remarkably important. Through initiatives like these, traditional criminal police agencies are transformed into immigration law enforcement agencies. In the process, borders effectively migrate. Instead of the international boundary being situated along a specific geopolitical mark, uh, the power of immigration policing that reaches into communities well into the nation's interior means that borders can be and are created anywhere. As border policing has spread, so too has resistance. Brown writes about organizing that occurred in deeply conservative, politically conservative Tennessee after a large immigration raid at a packing plant there. And similar examples could come from Texas or Georgia, Florida or Iowa and other states that are consistently governed by immigration restrictionists. If borders can be dislodged from international boundaries so that they can be anywhere 
or everywhere at any time, then we've reached a point in the evolution of the juridical understanding of migration where the border as a legal construct attached to a specific geographic location is at best only a partially accurate description of the border. To find a more comprehensive definition of the border, we might instead think of borders as mobile exercise of police power capable of encircling people deemed deviant. Perhaps that deviance is tied to citizenship status with borders encircling migrants. Or as Nandita Sharma's uh, contribution to the book illustrates, perhaps it is tied to enslavement, the legal status as so-called coolie labor in British occupied India. Perhaps it's sharecroppers in the United States of the early 20th century or people convicted of criminal offenses more recently. Through various technologies, all of which are deployed or have been deployed under the authority of legal regimes, each of these markers of deviance has distinguished the desirable from undesirable members of a community. In effect, deviance has constituted the borders of a national community. On the inside are the righteous people in need of protection. On the outside, the fallen, dejected, dangerous bodies of the enemy, to paraphrase Jessica Evans's contribution about Canada. This is an amalgamation of undeserving bodies who are rightfully excluded because they perpetually pose a threat either to the bodily integrity of individual members of the community or worse, to the community's very existence. The stakes are, are high, so policing borders becomes necessary in that logic. To the overseer's whip or the police officer's baton, violence, always threatened and sometimes realized, is the sign that all is in order. A border without police is a border that does not exist. A community that has no border is a community that has no control. A community without control is a community that is not sovereign. And without sovereignty, all that is left is chaos of a romanticized community run amok by aliens. Standalone border policing agencies, of course, are, are no exception. Their tools are the same. In the United States, there's tens of thousands of law enforcement agents who, who work for the Federal Immigration and Customs Enforcement or the Customs and Border Protection Agencies, the two uh, primary divisions of the Federal Department of Homeland Security with responsibility for immigration law enforcement um, uh, duties. Their task is to identify people who have potentially violated immigration law, apprehend those individuals, and forcibly remove them from the United States. To do, the, to do this, they are bolstered by the late 20th century's policy innovation, a sprawling archipelago of prisons. Their steel and concrete architecture putting on display the brute force that the state is willing to expend to protect citizens from aliens. They are also aided by an early 21st century addition to this continuum of unfreedom, an evocative phrase that Anya Misbach deploys both ICE and the Customs and Border Protection tap previously unimaginably large amounts of digitized data, digitized data from motor vehicle driving records to electricity usage, all accessible almost instantaneously through sophisticated portals that are created and maintained and then contracted to the federal government by third party private entities like Palantir and Thomson Routers. The border spectacle that Ezra Kaitat describes in the Turkish detention context is well-resourced and on solid legal ground in the United States. Congress lavishes ICE and Customs and Border Protection with generous funding to police migrants. Courts afford immigration authorities immense flexibility in identifying and apprehending, confining, excluding, and deporting people. Border policing has become naturalized such that its existence is not doubted. Its, its form is rarely questioned. When it comes to border policing, the state can exempt, it, to, to quote for, from uh, Anisha Nath's uh, contribution, exempt itself from having to explain why it does just what it does. Indeed, the state's violence in defense of borders is justified so thoroughly 
by the migrant's legal transgression that it's difficult to see the state's coercion as violence. If a migrant has violated immigration law, is it even violence to tear a child from a parent, to confine an entire family together, to banish someone from the place that they call home? As borders have migrated, it also means that borders can be transgressed anywhere at any moment through a variety of methods. Though borders shift in form and in place, policing movement remains central to their vitality. The border's significance wanes as movement becomes more accessible. This is the freedom of mobility that Brown says is, is, the, is at the heart of an abolitionist politics. And freedom of movement, in Sharma's words, build, building from our rent, is perhaps the most elementary of all human liberties. Humanity begins with the story of mobility, escaping, escaping ancient oceans, ocean waters in some pre-human form. In multiple versions, mobility defines conceptions of a people. In Islam, mobility begins with the Prophet Muhammad. In Christianity, with the first family. For Jews across the centuries, mobility has been critical to survival. For many migrants today, it means much the same thing. For others, it means opportunity. Either way, mobility remains an essential component of self-realization, an exercise of autonomy. When the state elects to curtail, even to eliminate, cross-border movement of people through policing, then perhaps it is right to think of actual mobility as inherently abolitionist. By moving across the very borders into which states invest so much to police, Migrants prefigure a world without police borders. Migrants do not negate the existence of borders. They merely highlight the viciousness of states in such a way that perhaps will render borders obsolete. Assessed through the perspective of time, migrants are the future just as they are the past. In the words of the Colombian novelist Laura Restrepo, the future is not sedentary civilization, but mobility. We will all be moving soon. Some of us will move out of fear, the fear of death, of starvation, of violence. Some out of despair, despair over the present, despair over the future. Some out of love, love of family, love of a shared vision of a community. Some out of adventure, the adventure of something new, the adventure of walking unfamiliar streets some out of a complicated mix of reasons that even they do not understand. Some for reasons that I cannot contemplate, perhaps that we collect collectively today cannot imagine because neither the past nor the present prepare us fully for the future. Just like none of the reasons for migration should be idealized, neither the past nor the future should re be romanticized. Indeed, this collection stands firmly as a call to embrace alternatives to the present romanticization of the past that leads to a fetishization of a nation state's bureaucratic ability to order people, organize people by worth. This reason justifies migration, that reason does not. This person bears the good reason, but not the bad. That person bears the bad only, but not the good. Instead of reproducing the hierarchy of reasons that fill immigration statutes around the world, this collection stands squarely alongside the migratory, migratory future that the novelist Restrepo sees. Perhaps the future is perhaps in which caremongering forms the basis of an alternative conceptualization of citizenship, as Davis and Fater hope, where solidarity with criminalized people exists as Moffat calls for or where law guarantees rights on the basis of one's status as a person rather than on one's birthright in an unequal world, as Abhi and Larios suggest. Today is the moment in which it is imperative that we take seriously those alternative futures. And for doing so, I commend each of the contributors to this volume and look forward to the conversation that follows these remarks. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Cesar, for giving us
so much to think about. Um, and before we move to um, uh, some um, your your questions and comments, I want to invite Shari and Stephanie to kind of step in and um, maybe uh, talk to the panelists and give us some of your their thoughts. They're the editors of this fantastic collection, the people who brought the contributors and uh, the panel together. So Shari Aitken is Associate Professor of Law and Academic Director of a new graduate diploma in Immigration and Citizenship Law at Queen's University. And her research interests include comparative migration law and policy, as well as constructions of citizenship in ethnically divided societies. She's a past president of the Canadian Council for Refugees, a board member of FCJ Refugee Centre in Toronto and co-editor of the PKI Global Justice Journal and former editor in chief of the journal Refuge. And Stephanie, Stephanie Silverman is a global expert in immigration detention policy and practice. She's authored over 25 articles and book chapters and her sole authored book, The Detention Estate, looks closely at the rise and normalization of the Canadian detention system and is forthcoming with McGill Queen's University Press and um, I know her from of old from uh, the Centre on Pub Migration Public Policy and Society, um, where we were together, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Oh, scary how, how quickly time goes. Um, so Shari and Stephanie, can I invite you to um, uh, make your contribution? Stephanie? Um, <clears throat> I just, thank you everyone uh, for coming. I wanted to also acknowledge that some of the contributors from the book, as well as the workshop, as well as the special issue and our many conversations that Sherry and I have been very fortunate to have on the side of those formal avenues are present. Um, some have been coming in and out and uh, we just appreciate your making the time uh, to continue this conversation with us. Um, and yeah, I was just thinking more about how the workshop was, you know, better than I could have expected. <laughs> and I did that like with someone with very high expectations because as we all know, it takes a long time to put together an academic workshop. Um, and that, uh, that Sherry and I had envisaged it as the beginning of, of other sort of forms of exploration. And it's just um, so nice to be continuing this and the, the readers or the commenters on the book and also Bridget have been doing exactly that again and like they've been taking the book as a as a piece and then um, expanding out um, so I, um, I I really appreciate uh, how Kate gave us such a great overview um, of the book and how we are trying to bring these disparate conversations together um, and there are uh, pitfalls and challenges, but also, you know, lovely kind of synergies that came out of that. Um, I appreciate Elle's comments um, about sort of the factual situation and the very individual and personalized toll of these greater systems that Kate had been describing. So I, I thought that was uh, really interesting. Um, I hadn't heard the term gating before, so I'm going to have to uh, look that up and, and add it to my sadly expanding vocabulary. Um, and, and throughout when Cesar, uh, who always speaks very well, um, I, I was very taken with this idea of the romanticization of the past. Um, and I, I think our friends, like in more of the historical sociology side, are, are really bringing us new insights into that as well, because I certainly um, have been learning a lot uh, from this kind of continuous revision of history. And as we keep going back and looking at where these things came from, and, and I just myself spent a long time immersed in the history of Canadian detention policy um, in trying to write this book that British that Bridget mentioned. Um, and just uh, sort of these hidden in plain sight uh, which is something that I've been trying to do a lot of my own work, but I've seen it more and more in history. And I think um, that 
in the law, Sherry and Cesar and others are really showing us how that was done as well. And just one final comment, just about the word alternatives. <laughs> like everyone's talking about these alternative futures, but for me, it's almost like the word has been sullied uh, by alternative to detention. Um, so, so I'm just interested in this kind of um, word practice, like how do we take back this word or do we give it up and find a better word? And just in Canada, to meant to come off of what Elle and others were saying about these freedom convoy protests. People may have heard about it outside of Canada, but um, I was uh, people I've been talking have been saying that almost as though the flag itself is now associated with um, with the protests. And so the question is, do we try to take back the flag or do we do something else? And so I wonder if it's the same with alternative, like this word, like do we? Do something else when we think about like new futures do we leave the word alternative to the side um so yes thank you for your contributions and those are just some of my thoughts can i um can i just add if we're going to talk about new words um i also wonder about community um because i think communities so, so that was um just to be a bit provocative in the in the collection i noticed that people use community quite often and actually, what does community mean? Um, it's one of those words that's very kind of warm and fuzzy, but then sometimes the way it gets mobilized is really scary. Um, so that's just uh, another one to add to our kind of thinking about our vocabularies. Anyway, sorry, abusing my chairing, Shari. No, oh, that's actually a perfect segue. And I really do want to reiterate everything Stephanie said in terms of our, our note of thanks and appreciation to everyone on this panel for such thoughtful observations. Um, maybe I'll just uh, spring off uh, the question um, you've identified, Bridget, and, and Stephanie, you set out for us about our vocabularies. Um, and I think perhaps something that um, is woven through the book, um, but really urgently needs to be foregrounded today, um, is the need for uh, more careful vocabulary aligned with the goal of abolitionism. Alternatives to detention is government speak um, for recreating uh, the carceral state outside of the prison or detention center with all of its attendant harms and abuses. And um, I do think, you know, for example, uh, the, the, the success in BC um, around ending provincial detention, um, while important, doesn't get us to where we need to go, right? Because immigration holding centers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> are ever present. There's a brand new one in BC with expanded capacity. Um, and then even when people are released under an alternative detentions framework in the Canadian context or elsewhere, the carceral state is ever present because of that ankle bracelet, because of restrictions on mobility. You know, even people who are released um, are subject to uh, not just ankle bracelets and that kind of surveillance, but significant curtailment of their liberties. So we have to go beyond the focus on the carceral space as prison or detention center we have to start looking at the root causes um, uh, and how the violence of the state is exercised in relation um, to these ultimately social problems, whether we're talking about racism, enslavement, indentured labor, poverty, mental health problems. Um, whether we're looking at the prison or we're looking at immigration detention, the number of people locked up or denied their liberty simply because they're struggling with addictions and we respond to addictions, which is ultimately a mental health issue with the brute force of, of, of violence, there's something wrong with that picture. A colleague of ours, uh, Simon Wallace, uh, um, uh, just presented a very interesting study at a conference Stephanie and I attended uh, a few days ago in which uh, just in one short month last summer, he looked at all the detention uh, cases uh, that had been adjudicated um, in Canada and found that the vast majority of detainees uh, 
were not actually new entrants, uh, folks seeking entry into Canada. They were people who'd been in Canada years and sometimes decades and fell out of legal status, right? And I think that's a very interesting observation because it, you know, it really highlights that when we're talking about immigration detention, just as when we're talking about um, uh, prison in, in the criminal law context, we need to understand what the actual reasons the state deploys, uh, you know, for, for locking people up and denying their liberty, as Cesar was, was commenting, you know, this notion of who is deserving of unfreedom, we need to actually deconstruct that. It's a huge uh, challenge. So ultimately, um, I think every uh, presentation today underscored uh, the fact that abolitionism is not utopian. It's practical politics, as our friend Bridget would underscore, and we need to get there. And I really look forward to the conversation that hopefully ensues from now um, to help us get there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Shari. Um, so does anyone who hasn't yet spoken want to say anything, have some comments or, or question? I'm going to stop recording now. So 